Outside the walls of Hotel de Lanjac, everything was crazy in 1789. The yells and gunshots of political revolution rang throughout the night. Despite the chaos on the streets, the rooms remained austere, but the flurry of revolution soon came to the hotel. Not as a hail of cannonade, but through a rush of ideas. Emmanuel Joseph Soyez and Marquis de Lafayette walked into their acquaintance's room. That night they wrote France's founding document, a declaration of sorts. That acquaintance had already written his country's founding declaration, and Thomas Jefferson would consult for the Declaration of the Rights of Man. Hey, Cypher here. Historians often like to talk about how revolutions spread, and there's this general idea of a world revolution, as in how a new power dynamic embodied in an idea can sweep the world, rendering a whole series of revolutions into a singular movement. After all, ideas are inherently transnational. When interpreted this way, we can see that the French Revolution was neither the first nor last of one such world revolution mainly what's called the bourgeois or Atlantic Revolution. So, who started it? Who's the first mover? Well, that's actually kind of a loaded question. But the first generally recognized event in this Atlantic Revolution was the creation of the United States. And since I've already covered the causes of that revolution, the historiography of it, and how the American Constitution is intellectually dependent on foreign ideology, I think it's time to explore how Americans influenced the French Revolution that followed. So this is part of a big collaboration on French history, and a smaller kind of internal one with Atunchi films. So be sure to check out that playlist if you're not already on it. And anyways, on with the show. When talking about intellectual history, it's never as easy as saying some idea comes from another place. We all stand on the shoulders of giants. Nothing just gets invented. Instead, we iterate and innovate off of what's come before. That's the nature of creativity. Nothing's new under the sun. The fact is, the American Revolution was just as much influenced by ideology of its time as the French Revolution was indebted to the United States for they're all rooted in Enlightenment radicalism. As humanism and the secular reaction to the Reformation mixed throughout the 16th century, new philosophies arose. Social contract theory, deism, the scientific method, advanced mathematics, and the heliocentric system all came from this potent mixture. But a stark divide came to define the difference from British philosophers and those of the continent, especially in France. British philosophers like John Locke were less idealistic and more analytical. Their theories had profound consequences, but in a more practical sense. Whereas continental philosophers, such as René Descartes, were idealists, questioning the very nature of rationality itself. By the mid-18th century, there were so many of these rationalist intellectuals in France that they got the moniker philosophes. The term can apply to anyone engaging in what's called the Republic of Letters, as in anyone writing these open letters discussing philosophical issues of the day, but we'll get to that later. The term philosophes was primarily referring to Frenchmen. You had folks like Marquis de Condorcet, Denis Diderot, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, and most popular of them all, Voltaire. These guys were radicals of their day, speaking openly about challenging the social order and creating a new one. You know, wacky concepts like civil rights, free speech, public education, and tolerance. And most American founding fathers read these folks. Indeed, many were in open contact with them. So this Enlightenment radicalism affected the American Revolution, but they were a nebulous influence at best, save for one philosoph. Montesquieu's anonymous work, The Spirit of the Laws, was the greatest guide to how the American Republic was organized under the Constitution of 1787. The separation of powers through three branches was essentially his idea, and the founders stuck close to his vision. A Frenchman came up with America's governmental structure, but the French had an even more direct influence on the American Revolution. The Battle of Saratoga is considered to be the turning point of the American War of Independence. Not because of its military significance, but because of its diplomatic implications. 
Through a stunning victory on the battlefield, incidentally led by Benedict Arnold, King Louis XVI decided to intervene on behalf of the United States. By lending military support, France could defeat Britain and avenge their losses from the Seven Years' War, rebalancing the great powers and scoring another win in their ancient rivalry. And that support helped dearly. Louis sent ground troops under the Marquis de Lafayette, and Rochambeau later, along with a naval fleet which ultimately led to the defeat of Britain in the war. Keep in mind, Lafayette will come up again, because he was a philosoph himself. The war expanded beyond just the American Revolution, to an alliance with Spain and the Netherlands against Britain. And it was really a world war, ranging as far and wide as fighting in India, the Caribbean, and even some in Europe, including some fighting in Jersey, which was British territory, and an attempted invasion of Britain. All of which made the war continue into 1783, even though it effectively ended for the US two years prior. Still, France gained a lot of new territory as a result, but they incurred a huge debt because of it, and the resulting economic crisis ultimately led to the French Revolution. Parisian riots became more and more common throughout the 1780s. In order to raise taxes, the Estates General assembled, but the inherent inequality of that organization led to a call for a constitutional monarchy and the inciting incident for armed revolt was the removal of Jacques Necker as finance minister. Financial debt from the American Revolution caused the French Revolution. Before that, the United States sent Ben Franklin to negotiate the terms of this alliance and act as the American minister in France. While serving diplomatic functions, he also instilled some influence that would bring down the very monarchy he worked with. He swaggered about Paris making a show of American frontiersmanship by wearing furs and acting gruff. Just as they finished the treaties in 1778, Franklin published in French an annotated version of the Pennsylvania Constitution and Poor Richard's Almanac. He altered a great deal to extol the virtues of Republican government, and it instantly became a bestseller in France. It was so popular that when they gave a flagship for John Paul Jones to go raiding with, they named her the Bonhomme Richard, as in Poor Richard, Franklin's pen name. Franklin basically became the nexus of Republican sentiment, and they started using a term called Americanistas. As Condorcet said, Franklin was the only man from America to enjoy a great reputation in Europe. He even very publicly met Voltaire before his death. Franklin's embassy was replaced before the French Revolution, but when it finally came, he died early on, and the French Constituent Assembly declared three days of mourning in his honor. He was even later celebrated in the festival of Chateauvieux as a core part of the French Revolution. His ambassadorial replacement, Thomas Jefferson, exerted a direct influence on the French Revolution. He was close friends with Lafayette and secretly encouraged the revolution. Lafayette created the militia that went on to storm the Bastille and inaugurate the revolution. The very symbol of the revolution, the tricolor, was a combination of the militia's colors with the king's color. But Jefferson remained officially aloof to these events, partially because he thought France wasn't ready for liberalism. When it finally came time for Lafayette and Saez to write the Declaration of Rights, though, there was one clear person in Paris to proofread it. After all, Jefferson was a Virginian, and their 1776 Declaration of Rights, which was the basis for the French Declaration of the Rights of Man. Jefferson himself penned the Declaration of Independence, which reasserted the then declining notion of natural rights. So of course an argument for those made its way into the Declaration of Rights. It was the culmination of the Radical Enlightenment up to that point. As Condorcet said, Humankind had lost its rights, Montesquieu recovered them and gave them back to us. Which is actually a Voltaire quote. But it is not enough for these rights to be written in the books of philosophers and in the hearts of virtuous men. Ignorant or weak men must be able to read them in the example of a great people. America has given us this example. Its Declaration of Independence, a simple and sublime exposition of these rights, so sacred and so long forgotten. No nation has known them so well or preserved them with such perfect integrity. Across the channel, another American patriot was making waves. Thomas Paine, author of Common Sense, which basically excited the Continental Congress in 1776, enough to declare independence in the first place, had moved back to London in 1787. In 1791, he wrote a vindication of the rights of man in response to Edmund Burke's attack on it. 
but Prime Minister William Pitt thought that was too subversive and had it censured, wanting Paine tried for seditious libel. But Paine arrived in France before that could happen. From France he responded, if to expose the fraud and imposition of monarchy, and even species of hereditary government, to lessen the oppression of taxes, to propose plans for the education of helpless infancy, and the comfortable support of the aged and distressed, to endeavor to conciliate nations to each other, to extirpate the horrid practice of war, to promote universal peace, civilization, and commerce, and to break the chains of political superstition, and raise degraded man to his proper rank. If these things be libelous, let me live the life of a libeler, and let the name of libeler be engraved on my tomb. France gave him a hero's welcome, and along with 17 other foreigners, officially franchised him as a citizen. Payne even served in the legislative assembly, but the times were a-changin'. Popular opinion in revolutionary France was turning against the old liberalism of Montesquieu, Franklin, Jefferson, and Payne. Though both Jefferson and Paine were opposed to the U.S. Constitution, they only had small problems with the document. Whereas many French writers portrayed it as a betrayal of the revolution, many called the Federalists adversaries of democratic revolutionary values. France was turning for the worst in 1792. In September, an orgy of violence erupted in Paris, massacring more than a thousand people. Civil war and insurrection loomed over France, leading to serious counter-revolutionary fervor, all while wars with other European countries began. First, the National Assembly sentenced Louis XVI to the guillotine, but Maximilien Robespierre didn't think that was enough. He created tribunals to weed out and execute traitors to the revolution. Accusations flew, and it was clear France was under a reign of terror. Paine had voted against the execution of King Louis, though he had voted for the creation of the Republic, so he was one such accusation, landing him in prison. He languished under threat of guillotine for over a year while the terror ran its course. Seeing all this across the Atlantic, the United States took steps to distance herself from France. President George Washington instead ratified the Jay Treaty. It negotiated the British out of America's Northwest Territory and declared U.S. neutrality in the wars over the French Revolution. This was a betrayal of the 1778 alliance with France, though that state had officially ceased to exist in 1792. A few years after that treaty, U.S. neutrality was tested when French officials demanded that American dignitaries give bribes to enter negotiations in 1797. The XYZ affair, as it's called, spurred on a quasi-war between France and the United States. President Adams even declared Frenchmen enemy aliens through the incredibly contentious Alien and Sedition Acts. It was mostly a bunch of small-scale naval battles and raiding, and the two belligerents came to terms in 1800, officially ending the Franco-American alliance. Obviously, this chain of events had not endeared the French to American liberalism, but they had a new dictator who was more conciliatory. Napoleon gave up his aspirations for a new French colonial empire as Haiti continued to elude his grasp. In fact, during the Quasi-War, Adams had actually sent arms to Haiti to aid in her anti-slavery effort against France. Napoleon's brother was one of the main negotiators at the Convention of 1800 with the United States, and he'd eventually control Spain for a few years. But before that, Spain gifted Louisiana territory back to France in 1800. Napoleon planned to relaunch the French Empire with it, but they failed to conquer Haiti, leaving him as the dejected owner of a useless colony. Meanwhile in the U.S., a more pro-French politician became president. It was Thomas Jefferson again, and in a show of reconciliation for all this bad blood between the two countries, after they were once so close together, Napoleon sold Louisiana to the U.S. for $15 million, which as the borders became settled, it worked out to be about three cents an acre. After TJ got an astonishingly good deal on Louisiana, Americans from back east started to pour into New Orleans, the territory's only major city. Their Anglo-American culture would eventually merge with the established French, Spanish, and African culture that was already here, but it wasn't a seamless integration. The relationship between the French residents of Louisiana and these American newcomers was a lot like Tuco and Blondie, very much love-hate. Sometimes they would cooperate for mutual benefit, a lot of times they were at each other's throats. In many ways, the relationship between these two peoples was 
a microcosm of the broader cosmopolitan relationship between their two mother countries at the time. And I get a lot more into that in my addition to Project France, which is up on my channel now. Uh, or, you know, I don't know, it could be. I'm shooting this like two weeks into the past. So who's to fucking say? I don't know. Probably it is. Check that out after you finish Cypher's video. Or don't. I'm not the boss of you. Live your own fucking life. That was Atanshi Films, and he's talking about how a microcosm of this dynamic played out in New Orleans. The mixing and clashing of Anglos and Creoles after the purchase showed the strange relationship between France and the US that developed after our revolutions. Though we diverged greatly after the terror, going so far as to fight a small war, it's hard to deny the tremendous influence Americans had on the French Revolution and vice versa. This doesn't prove one revolution was subordinate to another, or any nonsensical nationalist narrative. Quite the opposite, really. A century before nationalism prevailed, radicals like Ben Franklin and Lafayette inaugurated these revolutions, not as separate occurrences, but in concert with one another. The Atlantic Revolution was tied together by its radicals. Cosmopolitanism drove these events. The idea that the philosophers could have a republic of letters beyond the bounds of typical sovereignty, and that they could speak to each other about these radical ideas regardless of what country they came from, is truly cosmopolitan. Above their allegiances to any particular country, their allegiance was to the Enlightenment. Beginning as a cynical virtue, or as Diogenes said, I am a citizen of the cosmos. Intellectuals like the Philosophes and the American Founding Fathers took on that cosmopolitanism. For as Thomas Paine said, Independence is my happiness, and I view things as they are. Without regard to place or person, my country is the world, and my religion is to do good. These intellectuals engaged in ideas that transcended borders. Their citizenship in a republic of letters brought down many real sovereignties to create numerous republics. America might have been the first, but she was just as indebted to France as the French Revolution was to her. A long and windy road left these cosmopolitan ideals behind, burying them in nationalism decades later. But the intellectual history of the Atlantic Revolution did not end in France. Many more came, such as Mexico, the Netherlands, and Gran Colombia. Cosmopolitanism was the real root of the Atlantic Revolution.